Is that right? The only reason that I'm giving the talk is that uh, Russian is not commonly spoken in the audience, I believe. Uh, but uh, I'm really mostly talking about Sir Gwais in Europe's work. And he's here, he will answer all the questions and uh, fix all my mistakes as we go along, I think. Um, so I want to tell you about uh, a project that uh, we've been doing in my company to build a, a DSL that effectively compiles a, a subset of Haskell to FPGA code and um, give you a little bit of a view of how we uh, use it and what, what sort of things you can do with it. Um, to some extent this has been done by other people in the past in different ways and so on, uh, but we have, I think, a, a few applications of it that uh, are contemporary. So, you know, the, the problem statement is um, uh, quite, quite easy. Uh, improve the productivity. Yeah? It's, it takes a long time to deal with FPGA programming and uh, designing uh, is sometimes off code is very difficult because these low level hardware languages are uh, you know, somewhat similar to assembly in a certain sense. So, what, what can you do about that? So, the, the, the strategy that Sir Gray came up with is let's build uh, a DSL that um, is embedded in Haskell and that GHC can compile to Verilog and uh, in addition that can be executed as a Haskell program uh, so that the testing can be to a certain degree removed from using the actual hardware uh, which can be by the way quite temperamental so I Consider myself a hardcore programmer until I saw FPGA programming. Uh, it makes kernel programming look really easy and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's quite painful to even do something like Hello World. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious and I'm paying for it. Uh, so, um, so, you know, the benefits are obvious. You, it, with stuff like Haskell, you can build abstractions very, very fast and um, Clearly, you know, being able to test without tinkering with hardware, with LEDs and other monstrous things is, uh, is advantageous. Um, one of our goals is that it can execute on multiple targets, uh, so CPU, FPGA, and what you will see later in the slides is that most systems have both, uh, and that, by the way, uh, makes things even more complicated and ugly, and uh, I, I can only give you a glimpse of our um, suffering there. Um, Important also is that the, the compiler can really help, so I want to indicate a few places where the Haskell compiler can detect some of the parallelism that you can exploit in the, in the hardware uh, without really uh, having to be very explicit about it. So the picture is simple. You start with an HHDL program, uh, which I suppose we are supposed to ha ha to uh, make fun of other things if I have understood Sir Gray correctly. Um, uh, and then you, you can get two things from that. One is Veridoc code, which is then typically combined, unfortunately, with very complex IP blocks that you get from third parties. These IP blocks talk with your hardware and that sort of thing. And uh, then you need vendor tools to put that thing in a so-called bin file that you upload into your target hardware. By the way, everything is called hardware, your program is called hardware, the hardware is called hardware, and I'm totally confused, but that, that's the way these people call everything. <laughs> the other direction to go is to compile it into a Haskell executable. The problem with that is, uh, so mostly that's very, very good, but unfortunately you have to build some sort of a model of these IP blocks that you were using. Yeah, so if you had some Ethernet interface and you got some third party piece of Verilog or so, you have to somehow glue a model of that to your uh, program, otherwise you can't uh, do your testing without the hardware. You can, however, still run this thing in a simulator. Yeah? So the, the standard code path uh, to develop a production kind of uh, element is you develop the code, you compile it to Verilog, you integrate the IP modules, you compile it with the vendor tools into a so-called bin file, yeah? so this is sort of a final stage of linking and magic that uh, I don't think you, they tell you the details of it, upload, run to the real hardware. More interesting in a way is the development cycle when you're testing, so um, somewhat similar, but you have two choices. After you have uh, written your code, you can either uh, simulate it and test it at Haskell software, uh, then you have to deal with the IP blocks as I mentioned earlier, but you get lots of benefits and in particular you can use Haskell test tools to generate test cases very, very easily. 
The, other, the alternative is to still use the test cases that you've generated, but um, actually run it in an FPGA simulator. The advantage of that is that you have no mucking around with the existing IP blocks. You have to find an equivalent in, uh, in, in, in the AHA or in inside Haskell to simulate them. Now, here's the first picture of a more real system. So this is a CPU FPGA hybrid system, and you see lots of arrows to various pieces of RAM and um, uh, buses. And if you think that these things just move data for you without you doing anything, you're completely mistaken. Yeah, there's lots of magic going on here with signaling that this and that and that has to happen, and, and uh, a fair amount of detail even to get very simple things done. Now, this is sort of a boring platform, has been around for a long time, so I don't really want to talk about it, but it is actually quite good to deal with, uh, with problems that have sparse data, for example. Sparse data is uh, relatively costly to access with a CPU because of all the caches, and on FPGAs you have, uh, if you buy the right kit, uh, much faster memory access and, and there can be advantages, for example, for graph algorithms. Um, the, the thing that kicked this whole effort off in our company uh, was that um, I, I'm friends with the people at Arista and they, uh, we, we were actually lying on the couch and he said to me, boy, I'm, actually, I'm announcing a new switch tomorrow um, with an FPGA. I said, boy, that's really interesting. Uh, one of my staff is uh, working on something to compile Haskell to uh, FPGA code and then uh, it clicked, and so Arista is very popular for fast processing in the finance world and that sort of thing, and uh, we, we thought that this would be a good match. So here's a picture of the Arista switch, um, and what you see is that it's broadly speaking similar to uh, what you have in a computer, except that there are some extra chips. There's one at the bottom, which is a, a fixed switch hardware for 16 ports, and then uh, there are eight extra Ethernet in interfaces that are connected to the FPGA. And the game is now totally obvious. Yeah? The FPGA at the top sits right in the data path. Yeah? And so this is uh, extremely nice. You don't have to uh, transport any data to and from a CPU or something like that. Those eight ports you can attack real time. And uh, there are lots of examples of uh, real-time problems that can benefit from this. Uh, you know, the least favorite would be perhaps uh, detecting BitTorrent files that fly by in a switch. Uh, you could quickly check some of them or stuff like that and cut the connections. Yeah, uh, but you could do network monitoring. And uh, there are people that actually want to trade uh, very, very fast on the markets. And they like things like this because you don't have to go to a CPU. By the way, in one of my last slides that I hope to get to, and I will show you that you cannot really handle 8, 10 gigabit Ethernet ports without using the FPGA. Yeah? So if you actually rely on the bus and go to the CPU, you will not be able to go at the appropriate speed. I'll show you a little calculation that uh, more or less proves that. So our approach is that um, apart from getting things working, which means more or less building a tool chain that links all the bits of IP that Arista comes with, we are going to be initially developing a set of libraries that contain combinators to do things like packet parsing and uh, printing. Uh, printing meaning uh, the generation of data that can be uh, output through one of the interfaces in this thing. Um, once we have the combinator libraries, which have actually started to work for us, uh, you can relatively quickly use the abstractions in a language like Haskell to build much more complex algorithms, as you might imagine. So here are two very simple uh, uses of the combinator. So this is a, a Hello FPGA. So this, this kind of uh, program is supposed to look at uh, packets that fly by and uh, see if the word Hello FPGA appears in the input string. And uh, I don't know exactly what it does when it finds it, yeah, but uh, certainly some bit will be sent or something like that or will register, yeah. And, and uh, the, what, you, what you see is something that is uh, digestible. Um, if you uh, wrote this in very long, this would be a fairly long story to uh, summarize this. There is also some magic in here, which I have no idea how, well, how it is exactly done. So, for example, the word wrapper. Uh, connects input and output to this algorithm. Uh, what on earth might be happening there? You'll have to ask the way after uh, I leave the country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but my, my flight is leaving very soon after this talk. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that wasn't intentional. Right? <laughs> 
<laughs> so uh, this one is much more interesting. Um, so here you see some expression that uh, detects an entire IPv4 packet header. Yeah, and now you see that you know this. It doesn't really look like Haskell to me, but I don't really know Haskell all that well, perhaps. Uh, and uh, you know, you you grab all the fields in the header. Each of these parsing functions will check the format is good and, and, and so on and fill the fields and so on. So you can actually, with very little effort, you can uh, grab the header out of a packet, which isn't so trivial. Yeah, if you've tried this even in C on an ordinary operating system, you'll be busy for a little while before you have this working. So, um, as I said earlier, you, you know you can have lots of dreams with this switch of Andy's uh, company. Uh, like streaming analytics, yeah, you put this switch in a big data center where all the LinkedIn packets fly into LinkedIn servers, yeah, and you could maybe do some very good graph analysis uh, right on the fly there uh, while the, the packets stream into the uh, data center. Yeah, uh, graphs are big, by the way, and uh, a billion vertices is quite normal now. Uh, by the way, that's not big by the graph 500 standards. Yeah, this is a tiny graph for people that really like the graphs, but if you are an ordinary human, uh, this is quite a big graph. Um, and uh, so th there are maybe opportunities. Uh, I'm not so sure yet that I completely understand what the commercial field here to, of applications, but what, what is absolutely true is that you can do things in the switch a lot faster than offloading it to servers. Yeah, so a good tool chain to write programs like this is probably uh, worth it. Um, a ticker plant, uh, so I didn't really know what ticker plants were at all. Um, uh, they don't grow um, and they're not green. Um, they, uh, yeah, uh, but they uh, basically uh, look at all the trades that are fed into uh, networks from uh, lots of sources. <coughs> And uh, the ticker plant builds a uniform stream um, of packet formats that summarize what has happened. Yeah, and to do this real time uh, is again quite a challenge, uh, particularly on a, on, a, on a busy exchange. And uh, to do this kind of thing, these things would have to be co-located and so on. The ticker plant is probably the most popular financial application, so most companies go bankrupt when they build one, so that's why we're definitely not doing that. But you can already buy ticker plants for any switch from all kinds of sources. And so uh, it's, it's just a good example of something that benefits from the environment, yeah, but is no longer a very sexy piece of software to write. Um, so, by the way, the interactions between the CPU and the FPGA in a case like this are very simple. So basically the CPU can extract summaries and uh, you know, send them out in whatever format or make them available on the web server. Uh, it's also very important to program the FPGA. Yeah, the CPU is actually used to upload the images into the FPGA and so on. So it's a bit of a command and control center. Uh, the FPGA itself takes all the traffic does the analysis on it and writes it in a normalized format and uh, can maybe do simple uh, data analysis uh, like maybe averages, stuff like that, uh, very, very easily uh, as the data flows through it. So, um, now, I, I think that the, the three slides that I have here are actually possibly the more, most interesting ones. So, first of all, when I've talked to the finance people uh, I, I heard that most of them reject the high-level language approach. They refer to Verilog at the last minute, and they basically say, we can't get it to go fast enough, and that sort of thing. Uh, so we believe that this is absolutely not necessary, but it does ultimately require some intuition and understanding to avoid writing very bad hardware code, yeah? uh, that maybe wastes a lot of gates and that sort of thing. It is fairly easy to go wrong. And it's not so clear to me yet how you actually would teach somebody like me who knows nothing about this yet to avoid these disasters. Yeah, but uh, perhaps a tutorial that indicates how much of your FPGA you are consuming is, uh, is, is not so hard to construct. Uh, secondly, there is compiler help. So one of the things that we saw immediately was that the high-level constructions can cause enormous amounts of duplications in the execution tree and the standard compiler techniques, things like constant propagation, redundant expression elimination, they will help a lot here. 
Yeah, so they can uh, they can take out all these duplicate expressions again and make sure that uh, you don't end up filling your entire FPGA array, for example, to do Hello World. Yeah, I think we had a disaster like that happen <laughs> initially. Um, so the second question is what I said earlier. So can you actually run real time with eight 10 gigabit Ethernet ports? Yeah, and the answer is yes if you're very very careful. Yeah, because it's, it's cutting it fairly close to even what the FPGA hardware can do. So the data frequency that can come in through these ports, through these eight ports into the FPGA, by the way, this is one of the biggest FPGAs you can buy from Altera at the moment. Yes, it's not a, not a small one. Uh, the, the, the amount of RAM is modest, some 8 or 16 gigabytes or something like that. Um, so the, the data rate is 156 megahertz. Um, the actual load that the switch can handle is 140 million packets per second. Now, if you look at what a PCIe bus can do, this is very important because that is the comparison point. Yeah, the comparison point is you would funnel off this data to a server and process it on the server. So there it is definitely less than 33 million SYN packets per second. Yeah, so a CPU under no circumstances can keep up with it and uh, I, I think that this is uh, completely constrained of the bus. Yeah. Um, now, how much do we have to spare if we eat up all these packets? Well, this is a quarter of the memory clock frequency of the FPGA and a quarter may sound like, oh, you're very, very safe, but you're actually very, very close. Yeah? It's fairly difficult to uh, still take things from memory when you only have uh, a factor 4 left in these two frequencies. Uh, so, with very careful HHDL programming, uh, you can keep up with all the traffic. And uh, we hope to have a demonstration of this in the, in the very near future to demonstrate that we can absorb um, 8 ports at full rate. Now, there are lots of blue spec people here, so we have to say something. Um, and so, what, what's, what are the differences? So, uh, first of all, probably because we haven't grown up, we're unashamedly functional. Yeah, we have not uh, uh, reverted to any kind of uh, dialects or something like that to uh, make uh, remove Haskell's abstractions or something like that. Um, HHDL is much less abstract, so it's much closer to the hardware, but it's still safe. Uh, so one example is that you can build netlists, you can not safely manage multiple clock domains. Um, effectively, um, one of the things that HHDL does is it extends Verilog with new operators. Yeah, it's, it's uh, perhaps uh, not a huge abstraction, it's just an, an extension in, with a different language. So like BlueSpec, by the way, it adds a very broad class of types yeah, to program with. Um, so the, the, the summary is that we've hoped to incorporate some of the Haskell benefits um, into hardware design, yeah, and um, I, I, this whole project, um, so I don't know how long Sir Gwei took before he uh, came to us, he thought about it for a very, very long time, uh, but this project from where we started to where we are now, with, you know, recognizing packet headers, doing, beginning to do uh, simple prints and so on, has, has started on April 1, yeah, and so that's really not so bad uh, to spend, you know, four or five months to uh, get a, a working tool chain working. And, uh, you know, we believe that uh, the value of this tool chain may lie with sophisticated developers, so maybe ourselves, yeah, we might use this to develop some very compelling uh, applications for these switches, for example. Um, uh, I'm not too sure that uh, we'll be selling hundreds of thousands of licenses like you might do to Microsoft Visual Studio or stuff like that. Yeah, I, I think this is uh, a specialist tool in a very complex domain, uh, but we believe that the tool um, have easily uh, will pay back the effort we've put in to, to build it. Um, thank you very much, and uh, as I said, I think it would be very good for uh, Sir Goy to answer the questions. <laughs> thank you. First of all, I just got one of these switches, so I'd love to get a copy of your software, because I didn't know what to do with the switch before. <laughs> <laughs> so so one of the, one of the, uh, the big problems here is, as you said, it's very, very painful working in FPGAs, and